Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for Ash Wednesday 2021, which falls on February 17th, are the same as they were last year and the year before that. Uh, Joel 2, 1 through 2, 12 through 17. Psalm 51, 1 through 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 20b through 610, and Matthew 6, 1 through 6, and 16 through 21. So as you said, Matt, that's the that's always the challenge, right? The, the, the text for this year and last year and the year before that and the year before that and the year before that. So the the main question becomes what is the what are the the ways in which this text sounds different, particularly I think this Ash Wednesday, uh, because last Ash, last Ash Wednesday, we were not quite in the pandemic. Uh, we were looking at uh, what this possibly could mean, but it really was a couple Sundays into Lent before we went into uh, lockdowns and stopped meeting in person. And so a lot of, uh, well, all the preachers out there are trying to figure out, okay, what are we doing for ashes and how are we marking this? But, uh, but I think, uh, and we're not a liturgical podcast, so I didn't think a whole lot about what I'm gonna do with ashes, uh, but, uh, but that's the lens, right? Through, uh, through which we hear this text this year is is still in uh, in this pandemic. And how do we hear this text differently? And and this day differently? And this time going into Lent differently? How can we help preachers out there think about um, think about this day at this moment? I think is is the primary question for uh, for this year. Well, and of course, the, the obvious thing here is that death is in the air this year in ways that it has not been for most of us in our lives. So mm. while we're recording this at the very end of January, at least in the United States, one out of every 750 people have died mm -hmm. uh, from the pandemic, probably more than that. Uh, some communities have been hit incredibly hard, some congregations incredibly hard. So the context is there. Mm -hmm for a day like this, and maybe not so much these texts in particular, although we can talk about that, but certainly the context of, you know, to dust you shall return and, and, <laughs> and, and not just the realization of that, but the, the deep pain that so many communities are feeling right now. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> no, I think cheer everybody that, up as we get started. No, so I, I think I that's just wonder true. How to... it's the rea it's the reality of the moment that we're in, and um, uh, the other side of that is, um, you know, just as we lean into the gospel, you know, how do you practice your piety, you know, in the midst of not only the um, the loss that has been experienced in terms of death but uh, the reality of our cultural conflicts, um, the um, weight of uh, mental health that people are experiencing having been um, you know, on quarantine for uh, a nearly uh, a year now, um, how do you practice your piety? Uh, how do you do that in a way that isn't arrogant? How do you do that in a way that um, draws attention to God? And uh, so the question of how do we do what is a practice that we do all the time, we gather together, we get this symbol of ashes, and we probably shouldn't do that this year. Uh, and how do we practice our piety? So I think um, the approach that I would uh, lean into um, uh, for the gospel reading, reading would be to start there, uh, to recognize that we're doing this not to be seen by others. And maybe this is an opportunity for us to remember what uh, the season of Lent does. It causes us to pause and to turn our attention to the presence and promise of God that ultimately is made, is confirmed in the life teachings death and resurrection of Jesus. And that we don't, I wanted to pause there to say that we don't jump straight to uh, the resurrection, that we linger in the difficulty of a life that called for a countercultural uh, reality. Um, and um, it's, not, it's not for others to see that we're doing this. 
Uh, and I, I think that's a challenge of this text that maybe this moment uh, truly invites us to reconsider. I like yeah, I, that. Oh. Go ahead, Caroline. Well, I, I, I want to uh, build off of one thing that you said, Joy, that I think is helpful in, in terms of, of this language of leaning into something, uh, leaning into, you know, we talk so much about uh, Lent being, uh, and it's appropriate, I think, for us to talk about the beginning of Lent and, and some, of the, uh, some of the realities around that. And we talk about Lent as a time of, of you know, giving up or what are we going to, and, and I, uh, several years ago, I issued all of that giving up and um, have over the years, and especially this year, thinking about what do we, what, what kinds of practices can we lean into uh, that, uh, that, that distinguish this time? And, uh, and, what, and that's where I, uh, one of the things that I heard in, in what you were saying, Joy, is that what are we leaning, what kinds of uh, ways of being, what kinds of ways of doing discipleship, not about denial, but leaning into uh, embodiment of discipleship in such a way uh, that uh, I, that you, like as you said is not is not for the sake of not for the sake of others but the sake of your own uh, your own uh, deepening relationship with God mm -hmm. and uh, maybe that's a framework to uh, think about uh, this passage and think about Lent. Rolf, you were going to jump in. Yeah, um, coming off, um, it's it seems to me that at least. Um, the two Old Testament uh, readings, the customary for today, Joel 2 and Psalm 51, and it's implicit in parts of the gospel, call for the counter-cultural practice. Uh, there's two different things that they call for that which are profoundly countercultural. The first is that we confess our own sins. As I reflect on the broader culture, our culture is damn good at confessing other people's sins. I've been watching politicians the last few months get in front of the mic and confess other people's sins. And um, never their own ever, never does anybody take uh, accountability for their own mistakes. They get up and they say, uh, you might be able to tell the politician I am speaking of, but one of them said, you know, a bad government costs people lives. And the person that was in front of the mic doing this um, is is, is uh, known for having made some really bad mistakes uh, in the pandemic, which cost people their lives. But there's there's no sense of irony. There's first of all, there's no sense of contrition, not even a sense of irony. That is, yeah, in, that was you, dude, right? Mm -hmm. So what we don't do on Ash Wednesday is come and confess other people's sins, although a lot of pastors do that in their sermons. Um, they think it's being prophetic. It's not in the Joel sense. We confess our own sins. And that is something that our culture doesn't know how to do. Because our culture doesn't have a gracious and merciful God to whom we go. And that's the other piece is return to the Lord. Joel, um, Joel among the prophets is unique because he actually thinks worship is grace bearing and beneficial. Amos, Isaiah, probably Hosea, Micah, they don't think much of worship. They think worship is just a rote ritual people go through that doesn't change them. Joel's different. Joel says, no, actually, I think um, sound the trumpet and gather people for worship. Um, so the people that are there on Ash Wednesday are the people that actually think that worship bears the grace of God in some way. And we do believe that. And so Joel says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, bound in steadfast love. And then he's got this beautiful, beautiful um, line, rend your hearts, not your clothing, which to me also echoes Deuteronomy, circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. And so that the, this, the deep spiritual moment of Ash Wednesday to me is that we confess our own sins as an act of returning to God and we do so, um, and that and that then is the leads to what does that look like in practicing the piety? Full circle back to Joy's 
uh, Joy and Matthew, which is don't do this for the sake of appearances, but what does it actually mean to rend your heart and circumcise your heart? I really appreciate that, Ralph. Um, one of the uh, pieces, I, I thought you were going to say something also about, about Psalms, and in, in many ways that is one that is exactly about, you know, rending one's heart, you know, uh, 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 David's response uh, when um, the prophet, you know, called him out on his irony. Um, but uh, as we, we are often uh, told to put uh, Psalm 51 in the context of uh, King David's life. Um, but a few years ago, uh, I was in a context that was uh, pretty dysfunctional. And uh, it got to the point where uh, I could not preach because uh, people were looking for ways that anything I said had to be particularly pointing the finger at an individual and then they would you know say why did you say my life story from the pulpit so uh i did something that i've never done before never done since um but i told my uh bishop that i would be preaching a packet a prepared packet of sermons that had been done uh, uh, by an organization and uh i i taped the sermon so that, that there was proof that i was reading someone else's sermon and the commitment I made because I'm a biblical preacher, they, they gave a topical sermon um, and they gave a biblical sermon. And the commitment I gave was that I would always do the biblical sermon. Well, this sermon this year um, was, um, uh, as we began Lent, was uh, Psalm 51. And uh, the when I was preparing the sermon or preparing uh, to be able to deliver the sermon, I, in my prayer, I said, God, I know that this interpretation of the text and this wording of the sermon is faithful. I don't think I'm currently in a place where if I had been writing a sermon, I would write this to say to this congregation. But I promised that I would do the biblical text. So I'm not gonna cheat and jump over to the topical sermon. The sermon was setting the text of David in, uh, of the Psalm in the life of David to get David to make this prayer. And I, I read the sermon as written. So I wasn't talking about people. I wasn't talking about our contemporary context. I was in the scripture. And afterwards, an 83-year-old woman in the congregation came up to me and said, if you can preach that sermon to this congregation after what they've done to you, then I'm going to have to, have to ask God to rend my heart. And I tell that story to say that when we're talking about being biblical, especially in a time when people are feeling like, well, what are you talking about to me? That actually the Holy Spirit can intercede to do the work that only God can do if we will trust this ancient word. Appreciate the story, Joy, a lot. I, I want more details, but of course, you're not going to tell them all on the podcast. But... Not on the podcast, but yeah. we'll have coffee. All right. I, I want to turn the conversation, hopefully not too far of a different direction, but I, as I was looking at these texts and thinking about Ash Wednesday 2021, it seems so incredibly important that, a, and this is obvious, of course, that a preacher knows exactly who they're preaching to, which has become such a slippery thing these days with so much uh, online preaching and and kind of not always knowing where the message is is going, which I think is a good thing. But Ash Wednesday is typically such an insider kind of service, the people who come to these, these midweek services. So I can imagine a preacher needing some real clarity. You could talk a lot about practices. So many people have brought their practices home this year and have learned to do things on their own that ordinarily they would rely on a group or on, on a larger faith community for. We've talked about confession and that. We've talked about the need for the church to have something to say about mortality that isn't flippant in our current circumstances and complicated grief and all of the things that are so terrible. Uh, but there's also a need, I think, to preach outward as well and to help people get a sense for how the church 
is already really well equipped to deal with circumstances like this, that we have this kind of language where we shouldn't be surprised by, by suffering. We have words of hope they're going to sound incredibly countercultural. And so 2 Corinthians really resonates with me this year as a way for the church to preach, both to encourage its own, but also to preach outwardly and say, look, if you've been looking at church as, as kind of a country club or just kind of a, a really large support group, you've, you've missed something and we haven't portrayed it to you correctly in the way in which Paul talks about uh, his own sufferings being a means by which uh, Christ is manifest in him uh, toward the end of that passage. People tend to jump to the reconciliation language at the beginning, but the stuff towards the end, I think speaks really powerfully this year, especially as a way of helping a church recalibrate its sense of identity. Um, so we don't come out of this pandemic and assume there's a normal to go back to, but that somehow we use this crisis to, to regain an understanding of what Christian witness is supposed to look like in the world. I really appreciate that, Matt. And I, I realize that we're kind of like weaving in uh, all the texts kind of at the same time, uh, in part, again, what we're resonating with this year. I was thinking along the same lines with the, with the Matthew passage. And, uh, and what is it that, what is, what is it that is distinctive about the church in terms of its, uh, in terms of its practices, or in, in this case, in terms of its prayer, and I, this is where I, you don't necessarily have to add the verses, but you know, the, the verses that are missing in the Matthew passage are the Lord's prayer. <laughs> and so it, it's like, well, what, what does our prayer look like? Well, it looks like your kingdom come, your will be done. Uh, and, and the way in which the, which the Lord's prayer functions as a corrective there. Uh, to the kinds of prayer that is uh, the babbling, that's the, that's the verb in verse seven that's translated heap up empty phrases, the babbling that we hear, there's this, uh, there's this sense of, of what is it, what is it about, uh, what is it about our prayer, what is it about our practices, as you said, Matt, that are, uh, that are outward focused and uh, outward focused in that, what do people see? Or what do people experience, or what do people hear uh, in our prayer? And that's and that's the that's the corrective of the Lord's prayer here. Uh, and really going back to what you were saying, Rolf, that this is not that that this is um, what is it about? What is it about Ash Wednesday that's really calling attention to uh, a corrective in our own lives of seeing: Are we praying for God's kingdom, or are we praying uh, for ourselves? And so I think um, that's. I appreciated that. Thanks.